Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization with the mission and vision of furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I am a dental surgeon and also the course director for a series of online lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic portion. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 13, Peri-Implant Diseases. So peri-implant diseases are a collective term for inflammatory reactions in the soft and or hard tissues surrounding dental implants. As we alluded to in the previous lecture on complications, peri-implant diseases are probably the worst type of complication that can occur in oral implantology. So there's two types of diseases that we want to talk about. We're going to talk about one, peri-implant mucositis. So this is a reversible inflammatory reaction in the soft tissues surrounding a dental implant which are exposed to the oral environment with no bone loss. And then peri-implantitis, which is a term for inflammatory reactions in the hard and soft tissue with loss of supporting bone surrounding a dental implant exposed to the oral environment. So the incidence. The incidence of peri-implant disease is increasing. Some people think that peri-implant diseases are a minor thing, they occur rarely, and that they're just an inconvenience. However, as more people are getting dental implants placed, more clinicians are placing dental implants with varying degrees of skill. It's reported to be around 5 to 8% for selected dental implant systems. This is in a study by uh, Berglund, Pearson, Kling, uh, from the Journal of Clinical Periodontology in 2002. As well, those with a history of chronic periodontitis are about four to five times higher to develop peri-implant diseases as compared to those with no history of periodontitis. This is from a study from Carusis in 2003. So clinical manifestation, what are you going to see? So more or less, you're going to see the same things that you'd see in patients who have periodontitis or any other type of inflammation or infection inside the mouth. You're going to see a redness of the tissue. You're going to see soreness of the tissue to pressure or to occlusion. You're going to see evidence of mucosal inflammation, pocket formation with bleeding upon probing, superation in sulcus uh, around the implant, and bone resorption with a crater-like appearance. It's that classic sort of crater that you see in the coronal third of, of the implant. Uh, we'll show some radiographs later in this presentation. Bacterial biofilms as well, which, which mainly contain anaerobic bacteria and radiographic changes as described. So who gets uh, peri-implant diseases? Things like peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis. Well, we, we should actually have a fairly good idea of who these patients are going to be. These are our patients who came in, we went through the entire treatment planning and consent process, we started treatment, and during the course of treatment, we sort of said to ourselves, hmm, I wonder if this person is kind of buying into the program. And by this, I'm going to demonstrate a few photographs here. So in this picture here, this is a patient of mine who came in uh, who was seeking six implants and a, a fixed bar uh, for the retention of a removable denture. And as you can see, this lady came in. This is just prior to placing this lady's bar. You can see that the tissues around these implants, the healing abutments, were superbly clean, and the tissue displays no evidence of peri-implant mucositis. And despite the fact that I don't have the radiograph here to show you that there's no bone loss, I can assure you that there was no bone loss in this particular case. Take another patient who was receiving a fixed uh, bridge in the posterior uh, right mandible. Once again, you take a look at that tissue. Look how healthy that tissue is. There's no evidence of any inflammation in this tissue. There's no redness. There's no soreness. There's no exudate. Uh, it looks beautiful. So we'll go to another photograph here. 
and this is once again another patient uh, sorry I think this is the patient the initial patient that I showed you and you're just taking a look at the healing abutments look at these uh, these cover screw healing abutments look how clean they are the patient's been maintaining good oral hygiene uh, despite the fact that the uh, an actual denture sits on top of this the patient's been taking their time to go home at night take the denture out at night time clean the denture clean these healing abutments and when we take these cover screws off you can see that the tissue once again shows signs of healing it's it's it's, it's healthy it's healthy looking tissue now let's take a look at another patient. This is the patient, another patient who I was working on. And as you can see, this patient didn't quite understand what the meaning of oral hygiene possibly was. And as you can see, there's evidence of plaque and in some cases even calculus buildup on top of these healing abutments. And when we take these healing abutments off and take a look at the tissue, you can see that there is obvious inflammation, redness, bleeding. These tissues look angry. These don't look like the tissues of the patient that we saw previously in the photograph before. Here's another picture here, uh, even worst case scenario, you bring patients back for a follow-up. So a patient like that last patient I just showed you, you know, you set, set, set them up with their implants, you give them a fixed bar, and uh, all of a sudden they have more retention than what they previously had with their fixed, pro their removable prosthetic. Despite the fact that this is still a removable prosthetic, uh, this patient here doesn't look like this patient was taking the denture out at nighttime, as evidenced by the redness of the tissue. Uh, you're also going to see that there's, this patient basically decided he wasn't going to clean this bar. This is not a good thing. Uh, I, you basically have to scold these patients and remind them that they lost their teeth as a result of not having good oral hygiene. Uh, and if they continue along with this, in this particular case, I had to actually work very, very hard to try to get this patient the implant solution that we had achieved here. And with oral hygiene like this, this is not good. So this is a patient who basically got uh, a stern talk from myself and then we also uh, ensured that this patient saw my hygienist and had proper hygiene and proper hygiene instruction with respect to this uh, prosthesis and also ensured that this patient was placed on an appropriate follow-up regimen to ensure that this bar was being cleaned better than it's being cleaned right now. Here's another photograph of the same patient. So what do these things look like when people start getting peri-implant titus? So uh, in the, the previous cases, uh, we were just basically demonstrating some of the peri-implant mucositis things that you sort of see. In this sort of case here, this is a patient who we removed the uh, the crown on, and you can see on the sort of like in the 11 o'clock position, you sort of see a little bit of superation coming out from this implant. So do we define the implant quality of health skill. Uh, Dr. Carl, Carl Misch uh, came up with this uh, back in, uh, I believe, 2008, along with a number of other clinicians. And more or less, this paper was termed uh, Implant Success, Survival, and Failure. And this was developed via the PISA Consensus Conference through the ICOI. So as opposed to just talking about black and white with implants in terms of success and failure, success is defined as optimal health. We also have satisfactory survival, compromise survival and failure. So how do these uh, definitions sort of uh, break down? So success is basically defined as no pain or tenderness upon function, zero mobility. So not like the Harvard criteria from 1978 where mobility of less than one millimeter was acceptable. No mobility in, is defined as success. Uh, at least two millimeters of radiographic bone loss from the initial surgery. So ho we're hopefully going to get to a point in time where we don't accept any radiographic bone loss from, at the coronal aspect of the implant from initial surgery. Some people have hypothesized that this is due to compression necrosis of the cortical bone. There have been some innovations in implant design that have come forward. Hopefully this is going to be something which is removed. Uh, and uh, D, no exudate history. We then talk about survival of implants. So it's not success, it's not the criteria that we had previously, but survival, but survival which we say is satisfactory. So this is going to be no pain upon function. Once again, no mobility of the implant, about two to four millimeters of radiographic bone loss, but no exudate history. So then we talk about survival, but things are a bit compromised. So they may have some sensitivity on function. Once again, we're not going to accept mobility in terms of calling it either success or survival. Radiographic bone loss of about four millimeters, but it's less than half of the implant body and probing depths of less than seven millimeters, something which the patient can manage at home using a home oral hygiene aids. And they may have an exudate history in this case, but uh, with treatment, uh, we, can, uh, we can eliminate this exudate. And lastly, failure. We're going to talk about failure. In terms of failure, we talk about pain upon function of the implant. We talk about mobility of the implant. We talk about radiographic bone loss, which is half the length of the implant. And we talk about uncontrolled exudate, or that the implant is no longer inside the mouth. These implants have to be removed. 
So here's a photograph of another implant. This is an external hex implant, and you can see that there's an obvious exudate coming from this implant. Another uh, radiograph basically demonstrating that sort of scalloping appearance around the coronal, uh, in this case it's the coronal third of the implant, and if you were to take a look at this clinically, there would be an exudate coming from this as well. A photograph of the surgery to basically expose this lesion, you can see that there's bone and there's just a crater of bone uh, circumferentially around this implant. Peri-implant diseases or peri-implantitis, unlike periodontal disease where you end up seeing just like localized uh, sort of like a bone loss uh, in terms of a v vertical defect, uh, peri-implant diseases are like circumferential. You don't usually see this with patients who have periodontal disease and uh, it's, you know, it's not a nice thing to deal with. Another photograph basically demonstrating that sort of classic scalloping bone loss circumferentially around these implants. This is a patient I had. So as you can see from this, pa this case here, this patient had some redness around the tissue. The patient was complaining of some tenderness and some pain. It appears that the uh, coronal restoration that had been used or placed in order to uh, cover the screw access hole had been compromised and potentially leaking. When we take a look at this clinically, so we took the crown off, you can see that there is some exudate coming from the 7 o'clock position on this implant. Radiographically, what does this look like? You can see, once again, it's that class of scalloping appearance around the implant, and this patient has, uh, based on the, uh, the, the calibrated uh, software we had in our office, about 4.5 millimeters of bone loss. So what do we do for this patient? So we open this patient up, we, we remove the granulation tissue. Uh, the, the roughened surface on top of the implants, that's not our friend in this sort of case. Uh, normally we provide these roughened surfaces in order to sort of uh, promote osteoblasts to sort of come towards the implant or to improve upon the bone to implant uh, contact surface or surface area. Uh, however, when these, these areas also, if when it comes to peri-implant peri diseases, can become sort of like little uh, uh, little bunkers in which bacteria can basically hide and from a pr perspective of decontaminating these implant surfaces so that uh, that that these peri-implant diseases don't further progress can be a bit of a challenge. In this particular case we grafted some bone, uh, put a bit of a membrane on top of the patient and basically put a healing abutment on top. Uh, I can tell you from follow-up of this patient that this treatment was not successful. We were able to, via treatment, get this patient stable, and we'll talk a little bit more about treatment options and treatment for peri-implant disease near the end of this lecture. So causes of peri-implant diseases. So things like local tissue factors, things such as calculus, inflammation, or occlusal trauma. Poor tissue management at the implant placement uh, timing. Habits for the patient as well, things like chewing tobacco, smoking, and bruxism causes continued. We talk about the quality of bone where the implant was placed, so allowing a layer of intervening connective tissue between the bone and the implant surface. We talk about the quality of bone when the abutment and crown were placed, which hindered continuous, continued maturation of the surrounding bone. We also talk about the development of a hole of communication in the occlusal or facial tissue and disruption of the vascular network through elevation of the mucoperiosteum at the second stage surgery. We do know that when we raise flaps around teeth, there is no loss of bone. However, on implants, when we, uh, when we perform a stage two surgery and we flap the patient, full thickness mucoperiosteal flap, we, we do get bone loss. This is something which occurs only with implants. It doesn't occur with natural teeth. One other thing we should add in terms of causes is patients who have a history of periodontal disease. We do know that the pathogens that are involved in the development of peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis are the exact same pathogens that are involved in periodontitis. So management principles. We're going to talk about a few things here. We're going to talk about the elimination of plaque and calculus. We're going to talk about improved oral hygiene by the patient. We're going to talk about decontamination of the implant surface. We're going to talk about regeneration of lost bone if possible. And we're going to talk about gaining tissue integrity without regeneration of lost bone. And finally, oral antibiotic treatment. So treatment methods. So basically, the things we just described break down into four things here. So you talk about mechanical uh, treatment, so removing plaque calculus, that sort of stuff. We talk about non-surgical treatment, so augmenting the oral hygiene of the patient or using adjuncts like antibiotics. We talk about chemical agents, things like citric acid, chlorhexidine, and tetracycline to chemically detoxify the uh, implant surface. And then lastly, we talk about photonic solutions, things like CO2 lasers and diode lasers for specific applications. And sorry, lastly, we talk about surgical treatment, which is uh, full thickness flaps. 
So in terms of mechanical treatment, we talk about the removal of plaque and calculus. Sometimes this requires the removal of the prosthesis and cleansing of the prosthesis outside of the mouth. Things like plastic scalers, titanium scalers, and rubber tip covers for ultrasonics uh, can be used. You can also consider polishing the prosthesis to make it less likely to uh, build up things like plaque and calculus. So in terms of mechanical treatment, we covered this in the maintenance of uh, dental implant lecture. However, things like plastic scalers, which are available through a number of companies. Uh, Hugh Freedy makes a variety of uh, Gracie's, Curettes, and Sickle scalers to use in a similar manner to which uh, we use them for uh, regular teeth. Here's another photograph showing you some of the other tips that are available. Uh, titanium scalers uh, is covered in the, uh, in the maintenance of dental implant lecture. Non-surgical uh, treatment, uh, things like oral hygiene instruction, uh, telling patients, uh, talking about the various aids that they can use to keep things clean. Uh, this is, once again, also covered in the previous lecture. Uh, systemic antibiotics for patients. So sometimes what we'll do for patients who are exhibiting signs of periimplantitis, uh, I will put them on uh, flagell 500 milligrams, uh, one pill, three times a day for seven days in order to help address the anaerobic bacteria that are usually involved in the superation that we see in these cases. Uh, local antibiotics can also be used, things like Arrestin or Atrodox, uh, which works very well. So if you've never used Arrestin, more or less they come in these little uh, these single dose uh, ampules or compules. It's usually a, a dosage of minocycline microspheres, uh, which is one milligram. Or there's also Atrodox. The main difference between these is one is minocycline, the other is doxycycline. Arrestin is also a lot easier, cost-effective to use for single cases, whereas the Atrodox, you need to sort of treat multiple sites. There's also a mixing element that is involved uh, with Atrodox in terms of uh, needing to mix part A and part B, and once you uh, mix it, you only have a certain amount of time in which uh, you, can, you can use it. There's also some storage issues with Atrodox as well in the sense that you need to keep it uh, cool, whereas Arrestin, you can sort of just keep it inside uh, any operatory. Chemical agents that are out there, things like citric acid to detoxify the implant surface, things like chlorhexidine, things like tetracycline, or sodium hypochlorite 0.25% for in-office use, or 0.125% for home use. Photonic agents, things like the COT laser or the erbium YAG laser, uh, these are shown to be effective in terms of decontaminating the implant surface without overheating of the implant and the bone. There are diode lasers out there as well, and there are some studies to show that the 810 nanometer diode laser is excellent for the treatment of peri-implant uh, implant diseases. However, if one is to use this in and around the implant or the bone or even the tissue, you're going to find there's a significant amount of heat that's produced, and this can end up basically causing necrosis of bone and or uh, loss of the implant. So diode lasers have basically shown in some studies to not be effective in the treatment of peri-implant bone loss, but they have been shown to biostimulate the tissue and cause some eschar uh, formation in the form of sort of like an escharotomy. When someone gets a burn, you get that really, really thick, thick, thick burnt tissue. So more or less, the heat from these diode lasers sort of burns the tissue and sort of helps form a little bit of an eschar, uh, not, not, not to mention the heat kills bacteria. And when this eschar forms, it's a little bit more robust, very similar to how uh, keratinized tissue is more robust to the prevention of things like bacterial infiltration. So COT laser, what does it look like? Basically, they're these big bulky things that are ugly. Uh, however, they work fairly well as a, uh, as a knife and for also for the treatment of peri-implant diseases. The only problem with CO2 lasers is you're looking at an investment around thirty dollars to $50,000 to get something like this inside your office. Many of us have diode lasers inside our office. So diode laser, I'm going to show a few pictures here. You have the Ivoclar uh, Vavadent Odyssey, uh, the, uh, the SOL, which is made by Denmat. Another picture here of the Picasso laser. It's a very affordable uh, in-office laser. There's various uh, forms of this that come out there. There's the Picasso, the Picasso light, 3 watts, 7 watt. N nonetheless, these are all diode lasers. Here's a photograph of the old uh, diode, uh, sorry, the old Odyssey diode laser. And lastly, uh, the uh, Easy Lays from BioLays and the Epic from BioLays. These are all diode lasers. So these work really well for things like uh, troughing around uh, teeth for crowns, for, uh, for treatment of, uh, of ulcers and cold sores, uh, for uh, removal of soft tissues, for doing phrenectomies and all that sort of stuff. However, their application for the treatment of peri-implantitis is a bit limited. What you can do with these, as we've discussed, the thing about forming a bit of an eschar around the tissue, if the diode laser is used in this sort of a manner, so on the gingiva, it's shown that it can help biostimulate the tissue and also help in the promotion of that eschar formation so that the tissue is a little bit more robust to, the, to preventing bacterial infiltration. 
So surgical treatment, more or less, in many cases, what you need to do is you need to raise a full thickness flap. So there's no mobility on the implant. However, there's deep probing depth and you're thinking, okay, we need to go down here and do something. So the goals of surgical treatment, more or less, are the removal of that granulation tissue, detoxification of that implant surface using basically everything uh, but the kitchen sink and bone grafting or other regenerative procedures. Many times, as I discussed with the case that we, we worked on where we grafted the bone, remember that if there's going to be bacteria or infection inside uh, that site, this bone graft is not going to heal, right? It is not going to heal. And I think that's what happened in our case. We just weren't able to effectively detoxify or decontaminate that implant surface and that there or, or there was bacteria that came in from alternative sources but uh, I mean if you can't get the area nice and clean or, or make sure that's going to be something that where uh, there's going to be no bacteria or no infection or no problems uh, grafting bone is basically a bad idea and you need to be content with what you have so the next lecture is basically lecture 14 it's the basics of immediate implant dentistry once again as per previous lectures I have included all the references that we have used in the production of this lecture series. I would encourage you to look up these references and supplement, uh, use these as supplements to supplement your uh, knowledge from this didactic online series. And on behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for listening to our lecture.